Yuri Hyvonen, Senior Project pa Manager for PPE Powertrain Projects at Audi, Andrea Loy, Product Planning Electrify Powertrain Systems Division for ZF Group, and Zi Yu Su, the Research Scientist Automotive Products Research Laboratory at Hitachi America. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining me this afternoon. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. Um, so to kick off the discussion this afternoon, um, to give a bit of information about what we're talking about, it's clear um, then at the moment as consumer acceptance and the uptake of electric vehicles increases, um, which is then being followed by government action around the world in the form of subsidies and targets on the ban of ICE vehicles, that automotive companies are rapidly making the switch to an electric future. One of the questions that this has raised uh, is to what extent will these companies choose to produce components in-house versus outsourcing their production? Consequently, what could the impact be for a tier one uh, or even a tier two supplier down the supply chain? And there's examples of collaboration between suppliers and automakers, but will this continue as a trend? Um, and to what extent can suppliers keep up with the increasing demand and higher production volumes? So as a first question, um, Claudio, um, as IHS, as obviously as an analyst, is there a, a view that IHS have on this? Is there a, a certain sentiment in the industry at the moment? Yeah, great. Thanks, Liam. Thanks for the interesting question. And thanks also for giving me the opportunity of being the icebreaker within this panel discussion. Uh, uh, yeah, of course, like at IHS Market, we, we are like a market observer. So we do have, a, we do have our view in terms of um, e-motor e market. And looking at our data and uh, let's say, which are like a sort of translation of what we are getting from our interactions with all the major tier suppliers and OEMs, we do have a clear view about the future and assuming an, an horizon about until 20, 2030, 2032, we do have a general view which is growing in terms of uh, uh, more in-house uh, versus outsourcing. Of course, um, this has, has to be read as, is a, in a sort of trend and we do expect a first phase where uh, many and many OEMs uh, will, will start working to, into a license agreement with tier suppliers. This is something that um, is already happening today. Um, I, we just discussed it this morning about PSR example, um, but other, other, supply, other OEMs are adopting the same solution where the, the production is already happening in house, but using the strategic knowledge of some uh, tier suppliers. And then we do forecast a middle phase where um, the OEMs will start effectively the production house with their own capability and their own uh, strategic knowledge, but using or relying on tier suppliers for a certain volumes uh, exceeding the production capability of, of the in-house production, as well as covering certain regions rather than, than others. And then, of course, looking ahead, looking at the 2030, uh, we do see the, the, the OEMs uh, uh, moving more, more in-house rather than, than outsourcing and uh, picking up the major OEMs, the top 10 global OEMs. We do forecast that two-thirds of the overall production is expected to, uh, to be moved uh, entirely in-house. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily, we are joined by um, an automotive OEM today and also two suppliers. Um, I would open up the question to you as well. How do you see um, sort of the trends at the moment? And maybe you disagree with Claudio. Uh, maybe you agree. Well, maybe maybe I may start. Also, nice being here. Thanks for the introduction, Liam. Well, I started at Audi 22 years ago. And uh, around then, it was a pretty easy world. We made combustion engines. In our plant in Hungary, almost two million per, per year. It was a very simple world. You knew the products, uh, you knew the processes, the suppliers were, were pretty easy. And there was only competition inside the, inside the Volkswagen group between the different uh, engine plants about who will get which, uh, which project. And now with the first electric engines, this world has changed a lot. Uh, many of the uh, from the top management uh, level, think that electric engine is very something very simple. I use it to uh, raise or lower my window. I use it to change my seat, so it's nothing really, really, really hard. And of course, uh, then we could buy it. And uh, in the in the e-tron project, we had a long, long discussion, and uh, of course, many uh, finan financial figures, etc., going up and down. And uh, luckily for for us. Uh, uh, we decided to make the product uh, by, our, by ourselves, 
but it's a new game with electric engines. And uh, but I think if looking at the trend, we're looking into serious large scale production. So my prognosis will be that we'll probably have at least from uh, what I know from Volkswagen Group and also know from some of our uh, competitors, it's more the trend to going uh, making it in-house. Uh, but there can be some special uh, products, uh, some special markets where it's then uh, more feasible and more economic uh, to buy something from a, from a renowned uh, supplier. So that's from the old OEM's point of view. Of course, we have lots of uh, new companies in USA, in China, uh, who might see this uh, differently. But if we look at Tesla or, or Lucid, they are also in the same strategy, say, okay, we want to do everything uh, by ourselves. Yeah, thank you, Ari. Uh, Z, you and Andrea, um, if you have an opinion, happy for you to chime in here as well. Sure. Uh, thanks, first of all, for the uh, for the point from Gary. I totally see that e-mobility is a new game. I mean, I can only agree, and uh, I would say we're all in this together. And uh, I would say maybe just to bring some aspects of an old game that are still valid as of today. I mean, the competition between in-house and and suppliers, I mean, let it be tier one, tier two, tier whatever, uh, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a new game. It's not a, just an immobility, uh, let's say, topic that popped up from nothing. We are coming, we are very strong in transmission, hybrid transmissions, and there, I mean, we have seen for years, uh, I mean, many OEMs going into in-house, also decisive over the years, and we, we anyhow see a case for a collaboration in which a uh, tier one supplier, a supplier uh, can bring aspects that the OEM itself can cover, I would say with the same breadth and the same scope mm, that a supplier can do, mm, being able to cover and to cater different OEMs need. Mm, I see three points, mm, if I can summarize, is the topic of technology. Mm, as suppliers, we are very open, having also to answer several OEMs demands. Mm. Uh, um, a second one is the topic of region and footprint. Mm, let's say, of course, we are bound also to heritage so footprint in Europe, in uh, North, North America, etc. But I would say we are, uh, to a certain extent, being able to cover several volumes, several demands more flexible in that or can offer more flexibilities. And as Yari said, it's all about money <laughs> in the end, right? <laughs> so we need to be competitive. We are in that, uh, let's say, very focused, very targeted, um, let's say, across all components. And of course, the e-motor is one of the main of the powertrain. Mm. So I don't know if, T, you want to comment on that, on the topic? Yeah, I think uh, Andrew is definitely give a very comprehensive answer on this topic. Um, yeah, I might command just a few points. Uh, I think, first of all, from the perspective of a tier one supplier, I would definitely say, yeah, we, we are seeing there's a trend that uh, some OEMs are moving in uh, some portions in-house, but we we are hoping that they are not 100% in-house, and that's what we rely on us to survive. And uh, we are just seeing there are still places and possibilities for suppliers to serve. Uh, and I think to keep uh, advantage or keep uh, the position in the market, there are a few points that are very important for suppliers. One is, uh, I think, as uh, Andrea mentioned, to keep innovation advancement on the core technology, maybe leveraging uh, both new technologies and uh, the long-term experience and knowledge in the field as a supplier in the domain. Uh, secondly, I think what's most important to the business is the, the, the cost, the benefits, the value. So uh, we need to enhance the competitiveness, uh, well, to be more frankly, uh, just reducing the cost, which should be, could be achieved by optimization of design and manufacturing, creating benefits of scale or prioritizing the investment to share the burden with OEM customers. And uh, the next following two. We may have lost the there. We'll um, to customers. I think the current new era of uh, case vehicles, connect your donors, uh, share electric vehicles actually reminds me a lot where you did not only get the value from the hardware, but also the software, the ecosystem of it. So the future of e-mobility, I think is still full of different possibilities. 
suppliers may not only work inside the motor, but also seek advanced technologies in software, IoT technology, to make e-mobility more efficient, safe, and comfort. Um, I will take as an example here that uh, think about self-sensing smart motor. Uh, can you develop the software so customers uh, can work with it more efficiently? And last but not least, I think the capability to address the risk and growth. Um, I think as we are discussing here today, uh, what suppliers are facing is not uh, only a risk, but actually a fact in the market. However, um, at this time, I think it becomes more important for a supplier to have the mindset to consider it not only a risk, but also make yourself more efficient. And finally, we can serve our customer or benefit them better. So to keep our position in the market. Thank you, Ziyi, and thank you, everyone, uh, for your opinions on the, the first topic there. Um, and I think as, as a follow up to that, um, I think we've touched slightly on it already, but maybe this is a question um, for Yari, um, where we're talking about what can uh, suppliers do to make themselves more attractive um, to automotive OEMs? Is there anything in particular that they should focus on? Um, is, are there any requirements, requirements that need to be met? Mm -hmm. well, I, I think uh one very important requirement is try to be ahead, to have uh, new innovations, uh, new ideas. When we started the e-tron uh, project, uh, I think of the three main components of, uh, of the e-drive, uh, the motor, the gearbox, and uh, power electronics. Uh, we started with the first step doing ourselves active components and the motor itself. If you look at the search in the internet, you can see that we, we buy the gearboxes from uh, from a German uh, tier one supplier. And actually we buy the power electronics from Hitachi, from, from your house, uh, Xi And for the next generation, uh, we're talking about uh, for PPE, there's also also already been some press announcements uh, that we will now do more uh, steps by ourselves. But as Andrea and Xi mentioned, of course, it's, it's a together. Uh, I think uh, no OEM has the ambition to make everything, every component uh, by themselves. I think that complexity would be too much, too much. And of course, a uh, huge investment. But speaking in, in general, uh, I know some other OEMs who started uh, uh, by buying the, the complete axles uh, from, uh, from the tier one suppliers as, uh, as a whole package into the car and some even let their cars be uh, produced at, at other sites, at other suppliers. I think the general trend, at least for, for our group, which has a very uh, huge uh, scale ambition is to go electric. Uh, I think the main axle production would be uh, in-house. And of course, we also have to think of transformation. We have uh, very many combustion engine plants, uh, beautiful plants with, uh, with great people working there. And of course, they also need a need and perspective for the, for the future. What, what helps is, uh, what helps us is, that the Saudi, of course, were a quattro brand. Uh, the e-tron is a uh, full quattro. There's no rear drive option. And there could be rear drive options like in a Taycan Porsche. And there's also rear wheel drive only, but very many of the cars have two engines, uh, two motors, sorry. So that helps us uh, then to keep up the volume in, volume in the plants. And uh, if I can comment on that, I mean, transformation for European uh, players is, let's say, not only something that the OEMs, mm, let's say, have in their agenda. I mean, a lot of suppliers, and I mean, we are for sure part of that, uh, come from a very strong, mm, I would say, mechanical, uh, ICE-related business. And of course, we all have to trans transform the leading industrial sector in Europe. At ZF, we are in that, let's say since actually 2008 first sop of uh, of zf e-motors and of course we are betting and uh, investing heavily on getting capabilities and innovations let's say to a the maturity level where of course it can be i mean what uh, what yari said i mean the you suppliers should be kind of looking already at the next generation and we think we can do it also having access to a broad base of customers uh, and i think that's really in the end, the value uh, uh, and I think the main rationale for an OEMs, of course, cost is <laughs> is a topic, is the topic, uh, but of course also to get this uh, fresh and really external view 
on technology and really this open technology I discussed before. Is it going to be, and uh, I mean, maybe we will discuss in the following, is an, uh, an asynchronous motor, permanent magnet synchronous motor, externally excited motor, those topics that in the end impossible to control fully 100% from the single player. So you also need specialists who can serve several customers and several needs. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And I think that's so exciting about our business uh, for the time being. I spent 20 years ago, it was only uh, combustion engines, uh, some optimizations there, of course, fun, fun to drive. But now the electric engine, uh, electric motor gives much more possibilities, as you mentioned, different technologies and uh, different ideas, new ideas. So I think it's a whole new world. And the uh, electric motor is uh, also a very, very old invention, but I think uh, a bright future is actually still ahead. Does anyone else have uh, anything to add on that one? Or I'll move on to the, uh, the next area. OK, I'll move on. So we've touched again briefly on this already. Um, but what is there a right balance for, for OEMs and suppliers? Um, Yari has mentioned that uh, preference is to work on things in-house, um, but obviously system partners and, and a reliable um, supply chain are obviously key, especially at the moment as we see more companies uh, make the move to be fully electric. Um, so does anyone have an opinion on whether or not uh, there is a balance that can be struck and whether we'll see more collaboration in the future? Mm. Well, maybe just as one uh, one thing that Andrea mentioned earlier, and I think uh, GE also, I think software is, uh, is a big issue because uh, traditionally uh, for the combustion engine, uh, the, the control unit for a, for a combustion engine was a typical uh, supplier item from from a tier one supplier, and of course in the electric uh, electric world, it's it's a bit different. Uh, I think. Uh, to be honest, Tesla does a great job uh, with, with the software. And of course, they're also rated in uh, as a financial company on a totally different level uh, than the traditional OEMs we, we belong to. And I think that's also surely for a part of our software strength. So I think that's a very important field for the future. And I think that's also where suppliers, uh, from my point of view, have a very, very good chance. Uh, because it's not yet so established, uh, at least in, in our company. There are big plans. Uh, maybe I'm sure you have read about the car software organization build up with thousands of uh, software experts with the goal uh, to then to have our you know, own operation system for the Volkswagen Group cars. But on the way there, uh, I think uh, we will need lots of uh, know-how. And of course, our traditional partners uh, from the tier one or tier two suppliers uh, would be a partner of choice from, from my personal point of view. If I can uh, quickly add on that, I mean, I definitely see that, I mean, the topic of software as a, as a focus point of the collaboration. I mean, I would link actually two topics. On the one side, the absence of a clear winning standard technologically at the motor level, at cooling solutions, and also software solutions. And on the other hand, the topic of timeline. It is clear that, let's say, due to the, uh, let's say, emission norms, but I would say simply like the e-mobility trend that is taking up all across the world, I mean, all players will have to scale up their gains in e-mobility in whatever form. And so I think that only via, uh, I would say, via established partnership and established collaboration, this timeline can be jointly met. And I think also in new directions in how we cooperate in terms of, I mean, from a typical supplier OEM relationship to a more partnership approach. So, I mean, we see it coming more and more in the discussions with, the, with our customers. Is it not just about the delivery of the single subsystem? It is more like, how can we holistically across several programs across several technologies cooperate in depth technologically as one team to achieve the common goal. And I think also this shift in mindset and the shift really in collaboration is, is key in, uh, in our segment. I mean, and especially for the e-motor. 
Yeah, I think I can uh, also briefly comment on this one as well regarding the software on the, this topic. So I can understand that maybe in the long term, OEMs would have a deal to move this in-house as well. But um, I think at this stage, uh, as a supplier, we are also uh, uh, value this very much. And I think there is actually a, a main reason that suppliers should do this. Um, I had, I, just now I, I make a comparison of this new era of uh, electric vehicles as a smartphone. But there is a distinct, distinction, distinguished difference uh, between that, that is for smartphone, one software can be applied to all different brands or hardware or phones. However, in the case of vehicles, uh, uh, the software need to be tailored to your product because it is, you cannot just take another set of software because it's related to the comfort, the safety. Uh, they just can't, they, they need to be customized. And um, there's really, uh, I think, suppliers should do to, to uh, deliver this as a, uh, a whole system or a value to our customers to help us better achieve the good future of e mobility. Thank you, Dee. I think that's a good point. And um, I, I'm looking through some of the questions we've already got through from the audience, and maybe there's something that can um, tie into what we've just been discussing. Um, and one of the questions that we've got is, um, uh, it's, it, the question itself is aimed specifically at OEMs, but I think it applies to the, the wider market and suppliers as well. Um, how uh, do companies find the qualified and talented staff that they need uh, in these new emerging industries where previously the focus, the investment and the research have been obviously in ICE? Um, is that something that any of you can comment on? Well, to take the example of uh, eTron, which, which I uh, know very well, it was also a transformation. Uh, we didn't get any new staff or, or just very, very little uh, new staff uh, for production planning, which, which is my, my current area. So we took some uh, and volu who volunteered to do the, the challenging job uh, from the ICE side. Uh, they then transformed and learned how to uh, build a stator, how to impregnate it, uh, what are the specialities of, of the, the final assembly, which is uh, not so easy as um, uh, some, might, some might think. And it was also the same on the, uh, our guys, uh, colleagues from the R&D, was also the same uh, phenomenon. Um, very, very many uh, combustion engine designers then changed into the new world. And there were some colleagues uh, who came from another company who then had uh, stepped off the of their uh, electrification uh, path a bit, and they were looking then for for new jobs uh, in, in their favorite area, electric motors. Uh, and they were there then as kind of a technological spearhead. Uh, but the other way, the most uh, was really a transformation from uh, combustion engine to the electric motors. Thank you, Yari. Um, and I think uh, to tie into, again, some of the areas that have already been discussed, but obviously last week we saw the, the quite big news. Um, and I think, Yari, when we had discussed this previously, you said it was um, it was quite a shock um, that Jaguar has announced to go fully electric um, by 2025, which is obviously a very ambitious target. Um, how do you, uh, as a panel, um, see how they would have built up to this point? Do you think they would have already um, rapidly expanded their in-house capabilities, or would they be looking more to to work with those key strategic suppliers? Well, if I may comment on that, uh, I mean, I also agree that JLR uh, announcement is very bold and very courageous, and it's, uh, I would say, is a symptom of how serious the topic is in the agenda of a lot of OEMs. Uh, I mean, of course, it's not a it's not a mystery. JLR hasn't been in the forefront of uh, uh, electrification for the last years, but now it really looks like an upside down shift. And uh, of course, that's very promising. What I believe, I mean, but that's still a belief behind the announcement is that given the timeline, which is really really ambitious to bring let's say a full electrification across all vehicles by 2025, um, we're probably looking for a case that is that is including supplier necessarily. Mm. I mean, in the one or the other form, I also 
uh, can imagine they are considering seriously about in-house because they also have uh, the topic of transformation of plants, Solly Hall and all the other locations in the UK. But I think definitely, at least for the first wave, there's gonna be some supplier content being delivered. Let it be not probably not just the motor, it's probably gonna be more on the electronics and software side of things. But I think to meet that timeline and to bring a qualified vehicle on the road, um, you need to rely on a partner. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and do you think um, for, for partners and suppliers that they have the, um, the ability to meet the demand and the, the increase in volumes that are going to be expected from this sort of rapid expansion? And that's open for anyone to answer. I can well, say I, a clear I, yes <laughs> from my side. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's sorry. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, I also have a large respect for the colleagues from uh, JLR with, with uh, this step, because it's not only one car they're talking about. I think they already got their experience with, uh, with I-PACE, which I've also been driving. I think it's a very, uh, very interesting car, but it's, it's changing the whole product palette from, from SUVs to, to limousines in different sizes. So I think it's a very, very challenging operation. And uh, either they have a very, that's it's just speculation, have a very uh, good uh, integration uh, concept, how to integrate electric motors into the existing cars, or they will have to go into a totally new platform, which is uh, like a Volkswagen Group is doing with, uh, with MEB platform. Now with the ID3, ID4, the, the Audi uh, Q4, the Seat, uh, Elborn, and the uh, uh, Skoda Enyaq. And then to go, as you say, all in. And I would presume that it's then a huge investment uh, because 2025 is the day after tomorrow. So it will be exciting to see uh, how the colleagues are reacting. And if, if they can do it all by themselves, then it's, it's a great uh, achievement uh, for them. But I would also uh, not be surprised if there will be some major uh, suppliers uh, involved in, in a bigger way. Thanks, Jari. Um, and for the sort of the wider industry as well, I think um, that it is still a relevant discussion to have about can can suppliers um, ramp up their production to a level that is going to be needed. Um, are there any uh, any ways that suppliers um, can start doing this, or are they mainly reliant on an OEM to to back them and invest in their R and D and their production facilities? Well, we are uh, um, in the tech. Sorry, <laughs> No, no, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can um, come back later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely see the topic of developing a base design increasingly also coming in terms of cost, base invest, and so on on suppliers. Uh, there's going to be, I think Yari mentioned, and also Chi uh, just mentioned also the topic of personalization, customization, let's say, until the latest degree, uh, which is probably still going to be a case for yeah, uh, compensation uh, from the OEM to the supplier doing this exact uh, development work for them and only for them, uh, also in exclusivity partnership. But I think there's going to be a trend towards also relying on cost effective, efficient, also base design. So more going into a modular design probably gonna be per segment. And so we're gonna talk about a modular design for main drives in CD segments. I, th I believe that's probably where the industry will go that we will arrive on several, maybe different uh, base designs uh, from different players, mm. that it be suppliers, OEMs. Mm. I think also the example of MEB is a good one. Mm. So also OEMs themselves cooperating uh, on sharing technologies, platform based designs for several vehicles in the end. Thank you, Andrea. And Z, you, Z as well, you had something to add? Yeah, uh, thank you, Andrea. I think um, so. This question is mainly about the large volume required by the uh, OEMs. So, um, from my perspective, I think, uh, first of all, suppliers do have to, they, they do need to 
prioritize the investment to uh, actually establish the, the benefit of uh, scale. But at the same time, I think in this uh, new trend of immobility, one thing we are actually not that sure about, as many of you have, as many of you have already mentioned, is what is the future of it? Is it IPM motor? Is it uh, in real motor? Is it uh, XR motor? We, we, we don't know yet. Um, so the question comes to, to my end would be like, is it, this is a real uh, definite requirement from the, 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 uh, the, the, the OEM? I mean, over the, the, the years to come, um, I would see there will be many new materials, new technologies coming from tier two, tier one suppliers, and they all may change the landscape of the, the supply chain or the technology that's really used in the future. So um, would it be uh, more beneficial to, to the industry to have uh, we adopt uh, step by step or starting from yeah the, the in the in the large picture the the scale would be huge um, but when we are taking it year by year is it um, a good idea to to consider the uh, investment from a step by step or we have the so we have the chance to actually involve the technology and do not loss from amortization of the, uh, the, the 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 machines for example. Um, I think, yeah, that's something from my side. I think you've raised a, sorry, Yari, were you saying something there? Yeah, maybe just uh, two things to add. I, I think there probably will not be just, just one solution for all use cases or for all cars. I think probably we will see, we see the combination of like a PSM, a permanent synchronous machine on the rear axle, then an ASM on the, on the front axle if you use it only as a boost machine. Or you can have, if you have a real sporty car, have two uh, two PSMs. Or if you want to have a very uh, cost-effective car, then um, depending maybe only only ASMs. So I think the problem will not be just uh, one solution to say, okay, that's it, that's the engine. So we'll have different sizes, uh, different uh, technologies. But I think there will probably not be a clear clear picture. And uh, what I was actually hoping for after the combustion engine business uh, has been very, very affected by the regulations uh, considering emissions where with the new regulations every every few years. Again, if we go some, some time back, when I mean, you could say, okay, one car is like seven years and one engine is a two car generation. So like uh, you need a new engine for like some 12 to 14 years, uh, basic new engine and due to the emissions regulations in short term to say okay one on one and now in the latest generation about like three years and so for one car generation you need two new engines and uh, I personally was hoping like okay for with uh, with electric motor we won't have any problems with uh, NOx or, or, or uh, CO2 that it would be better but I think there is really a huge uh, competition uh, with, with many good companies around and uh, of course electric uh, car is lots of range uh, also due to the infrastructure is not not yet quite there where it should be I think that probably Jaguar will help uh, with the decision to have a better infrastructure so it will get it will get easier so uh, for the for the time being I think the cycle changes in the electric uh, motors will be in the next years and in the same region than with the combustion engines and then not not being able to say okay uh, we have one perfect design and it will take us uh, 10 years onwards I, I don't believe in that and i think of course uh, when talking about my area production production planning we'll then have to have flexible productions lines so that we can adopt new products uh, uh, very smoothly and and without a huge uh, huge investments and that's electric works uh, we see in Norway. Uh, they have been a huge financial backing in, in uh, Norway for electric cars. And of course, it's also a rich country uh, where where uh, cost of electricity is, is much lower than in the rest of Europe. And there we have, I think last year was the first time over 50% electric cars. And uh, now I have to do some commercial for us. Uh, the Audi e-tron was the most uh, sold car in Norway last year. Not uh, not of electric cars, but of all cars. So it shows that it uh, that it works if the if the infrastructure and uh, some additional backing from the government is is there. 
And I think uh, a big picture, which and a big challenge, which we face both, all who are in the automotive business, is really the transition, the transformation to the CO2 free or neutral uh, society. And I think car is uh, something that's very easy to count on the how the, how big the emissions are, are and uh, and it's easy to follow. Okay, how much uh, could you achieve? Uh, how much do you have to pay if you didn't achieve it? And so it's also very very transparent business. And I think this transition that's that's really a challenge, because for the time being, it's not yet uh, so much a pull from the car buyers who say, okay, electric car is, is the coolest thing there is. Luckily, there are these buyers and we have uh, brands which are very successful, only offering uh, electric cars. So it's, I think it's changing, but there still are very many customers who say, oh, I don't know where I can, where I can charge it. I don't have my own house. I live in the city. Uh, I don't why do I want to, to risk it. And so it's a really a big challenge for, for uh, all of us, uh, supplier tier two tier two tier one or an oem i think that's a huge deal uh, we have to manage and i i have um, <clears throat> a follow-up question here um probably for claudio would be best place to answer this but we've talked about the transition from ice um and we've we've talked about what these new technologies could be uh, potentially software being one um I know you gave us an overview this morning, uh, Claudio, of some some developments. But are there any technology trends in particular that people should be expecting or, or looking for over the next five ten years? Yeah, great question, Leon. Thanks. And uh, let me connect the dots from what has been said from from Yari a few minutes ago about this uh, general trend of adopting. I mean, of course, other technologies are coming to the market. The axle flux machines are coming. Um, I don't know the current excited solution from BMW. Um, are in the verge to be adopted in a, in a massive scale. Uh, looking at the data and from our perspective, uh, of course, it's hard to have a real forecast in, I don't know, 15 years horizon because um, some technological ch changes can happen uh, maybe in the next future. But looking into, into a medium horizon, what we do see as a chess market is probably the PM solution remaining the most adopted one in, in terms of, especially when, when we are talking about pure electric machines or the e-axle technologies overall. And um, as I was saying, uh, connecting the dots from what has been said for Yari, Yari um, there will be probably a trend of uh, mixing up the two technologies from asynchronous motors and uh, PM solutions, especially for the um, all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive technologies, adopting uh, the PM solutions into the highest powered uh, e-axle part, the rear one typically, and um, giving the, the four-wheel drive capability adding uh, induction machines into the front. This is something that has been already viewed a lot into the Tesla applications and uh, there's something that is, is expected for within the MEB platform. So in terms of volumes, these are two uh, interesting uh, mega trends expected. Um, of course, that said, that the technological uh, evolution is moving fast and uh, uh, so uh, it's really hard to have a, a longer view rather more than 10, 12 years for now. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, anyone else want to comment on this one? Yeah, um, um, if I can come to, uh, to a quick comment. Um, I mean, it's exactly, I mean, the difficulty Claudia just mentioned that really tightly connects to what Yari was saying. I mean, like uh, there is no clear winning standard per segment per actually per vehicle, I mean, like uh, we're doing some optimization and some designs on a vehicle basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, the technology is not yet so well settled where we can say, okay, for this segment, it's for sure gonna be an ASM mm -hmm. or it's for sure gonna be a PSM. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, of course, in the past, we also had a lot of variants. Mm -hmm. Was it a V6, V8? I mean, for the engines, I mean, is it a seven speed, eight speed, nine speed transmission and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, I mean, in I think this now has kind of come to a, to another level uh, in the in the electrification space, where we have really a framework of solutions that are possible at any at any given point. And of course, we are all working, let's say, on a premise that we don't have outside of the mere motor and powertrains 
other changes. I think, for example, at the battery. I mean, the discussion we are having also on efficiency and the push on efficiency is all driven or mostly driven from sustainability and, uh, of course, economic sense of a larger battery for a given range or not. I think there we might also see shift in prioritization of what parameter, what variable do we want to optimize depending on those trends long term. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and I'm conscious of time, so we, we've got around five minutes left to discuss um, sort of our, our final topics um, before we move on to the, the audience interaction and Q&A. So I'll, I'll move us forward. Um, as a final question, and I think we have had some questions in Q&A that we'll, we'll touch on this, um, but what impact does geographical location have on and everything that we've been discussing? Um, I, I would assume uh, that obviously things would look very, very different across different countries um, and regions, so Europe, uh, North America and Asia in particular. I, I think there will be I think, uh, uh, regional di differences. Uh, we, we already see that, that Europe is, uh, if, we look at, if you look at our, our cars, uh, e-tron is outselling the Q7 and then Q8 in, in some markets, uh, especially strong in, in Europe. But for example, in, in the USA, uh, we have prominent uh, brands in, in USA electrification, but it's still more in a niche, uh, except some 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 coastal regions, uh, California, etc. Electric cars are, are very very strong, but in the, in the whole the USA is a bit behind. And I think China has very many companies, smaller companies making electric cars for, for very uh, um, affordable prices. But I think it also de depends very much on the government subsidiaries. Uh, so if there are some changes, it can have a big effect on in, in both directions. I think for the time being, uh, I personally see Europe as an, as an engine with a green deal of the European Union uh, being very strong and also due to the, as I mentioned on, uh, that you have to pay uh, millions or, or even billions if you fail the CO2 goals. So that's a very strong motivator. Uh, and as I also mentioned earlier on, we have to get the infrastructure to work with it because otherwise we'll be in big, big problem uh, having to try to push the cars into the market and uh, with very uh, cautious uh, customers. I think, as I mentioned, it, it can work like in Norway. That's a, that's a very good example. But I think we are not quite there yet. So I think the governmental uh, would also be, be good to uh, support also the, the infrastructure to uh, allow and, and support the transition to, uh, to less uh, or to the decarbonized society. Uh, can I command a few here? Yes, please do. Yeah, I think uh, Yari, what Yari just said is like is very true. Um, but uh, just to add more on that, I think uh, there are definitely regional differences, but the reality is actually uh, more complicated. A lot of different uh, impact factors play important roles here. So uh, if we first look at Europe, um, the many countries such as the, the UK, Denmark, France, uh, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, just to name a few, uh, have very clear roadmap to phase out ICE and uh, strong regulations or incentives. So um, it looks like OEMs in Europe are moving very rapidly, uh, catching uh, what our, what have been discussed uh, so far, into pure electric vehicles. And in this sense, they are more willing to move core EV components in-house to secure core technology in the long term. Um, we also noticed that many European uh, OEMs are actually big names, which means they have the capability to invest to the internal R&D to, to do this uh, big transition. Um, and if we look at uh, North America, it is, uh, of course, also going to full electric in the long term, but due to many factors, uh, including policy, uh, which I already just mentioned as well, we also expect a hybrid electric vehicle to grow in the next few years. Um, consider there is less incentive in hybrid vehicles. Uh, I think actually OEMs might be happy to benefit from the competitive market, uh, auto market, and outsource it to uh, suppliers. 
Um, on supplier side, which means they shall take this chance to develop core competency and also establish a, maybe a long-term, uh, more holistic relationship with the OEMs. Um, next up, when uh, if we look at China, China's market is very interesting, actually. Um, also, very, uh, there is strong government uh, policy incentive over here. But uh, at, at this region, there is not only global OEM presence, but also a lot of uh, local independent uh, OEMs who may not have the large capital to go full in-house and, and leave spaces to uh, suppliers. And also uh, Asian market, I think also have very strong potential uh, growth on two builders, uh, which means motorcycles, et cetera. This all explains uh, the, some possible regional differences. Um, then my, I would also want to give one example that uh, regarding other factors that makes a difference. I think nowadays the concept of e-mobility is evolving. But the theme is always about, I think, uh, safe, uh, comfort, and sustainability. That being said, uh, there are OEMs, including a lot of uh, startups nowadays, that they want to focus on one of these aspects uh, first compared to others. So, for example, a company with products focusing on the last mile delivery or logistic trucks may want to actually dedicate their R&D resources to autonomous driving and leaving out the motors to experts in the field, uh, which I mean suppliers. So um, this question, I think, regional is definitely an important factor, but the reality shows there would be many other important factors also play a role here, and they are actually twisted with each other. So the future is still full of possibilities, yeah. I think that's a great point you mentioned to you. I think it's also, What's going on with, with our customers? Uh, how are the demands? Are they looking for, for a driving machine uh, like this one to have joy in driving? Or is it more to have a, have a smartphone on, on wheels uh, and more about being connected, being transported, and not about uh, driving itself? So I, it's a really exciting world. And I think everyone who's in automotive business is, is very lucky compared to the decades before uh, where, where the world was uh, fairly standard. Of course, you have to be a bit of a fan of uh, disruption and what ha what happens. But those who do are, uh, I think, uh, it's, it's a great fight. Yeah, very much agree. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and in the for the benefit of time, I should say, um, I'm going to move us on to um, audience Q and A. We have had a a lot of questions come in, which is brilliant. Um, we'll get through as many of these as we can uh, in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, quick question to you all, would you be happy uh, after we've finished, uh, if there are a, a lot of questions left over, uh, if we put some time in, we can answer the ones that we don't get round to for the audience at home? Sure. Perfect. Um, so if your question isn't answered now, uh, bear with us and we will we will publish a uh, short Q&A uh, this Thursday when everything is made available. Um, but we'll start working our way through the ones we've had in. Um, do use the thumbs up button on questions. If you want to vote them up to the top, that means that we'll get around to these faster. So if you see a question there that you particularly want answered, uh, make sure we bring it to our attention. So one question we have from Matteo Cialesi is, uh, he asks, is hairpin or round wire technology um, for EV motors, uh, so I presume which one of those would would this panel see as being the uh, the main future for EV motors? I, I think that's Claudio's uh, favorite question from the from the, <laughs> of, from, from the morning session. Uh, I, I think also here we have uh, both concepts on the market. Uh, like if you look at the video in the uh, internet, you can see our production the e-tron uh, very clearly that it's round wire. And also, if you look at the press statements, you see MEB uh, platform is on the hairpin technology. Also, the, the Taycan, the J1 platform uh, is on, on the hairpin. So I think lots of speaks for the hairpin due to the larger amount of, uh, of copper. So and more performance, more efficiency. But I'd say there's a trend. But in, on the other hand, if you have to have a very uh, easy to produce uh, low cost, uh, uh, motor which is not so on the performance density, then the round mile round mile might still be a very very good solution. And if we look at the Tesla motors, uh, they're round wire. So I think both concepts work. But I'd say uh, there is a trend uh, towards hairpin from from my point of view. 
Thank you very much, Yari. Um, so I'll move on to the next question. Um, it's a similar uh, sort of question uh, asking about a trend. Um, so asking uh, to the entire panel here, um, is there a trend in uh, insulation materials um, and they name PEEK uh, or enameled um, and what influence does an 800 volt system uh, have on the windings and motors that are used? If anyone's happy to take that one. Well, I think uh, 800 volt system uh, has more requirements on the, in the, on the isolation system and such uh, coatings uh, can be a very, very good solution. I have to be, the, I want to be a bit indifferent on, on, on that. Uh, so I think uh, 800 volts, uh, we of course looked very uh, strongly when starting with the PPE project, looking at, at both systems. Uh, I think both work. Uh, and also in the, in the Volkswagen group, we have both solutions. And I think it's also, what, what do you need? Do you, uh, Want to have a more high performance? I think it's also a bit similar to the discussion uh, and the analysis for Claudia about AC, about SIG and IGPTs on, on the power electronics. It's about uh, the use case. Your car, do you need the high performance density, the high the high performance, uh, and do you have the customers who want to pay for it, or do you go to the not so uh, power relevant cars uh, on a large volume? And uh, probably the other 400 volt system will be uh, the, the more suitable answer. I, I think uh, as we discussed uh, earlier on, I think it's not A or B, but I think probably even a longer uh, way it will be A and B. Thank you, Yari. Um, and we have a, another question um, through from Lauren Stavart. Um, so he asks uh, that OEMs are still car builders and not e-motor specialists yet, uh, or in some cases at least. Um, could the focus on OEM uh, in-house development and production lead to more focus on established solutions and optimizations of one type of e-powertrain? And I think we touched on this earlier, um, saying that, that might not be the case um, and less focus on innovative new solutions um, and the questions just disappeared uh, on innovative new solutions uh, which would normally come from more specialized um, tier suppliers I mean I can maybe take that of course we do see again uh, a clear differentiation case for suppliers towards an OEM who also has in-house capability for motors, but that's not only about the motors. I also think about the inverter, the system, uh, the also the small reducer uh, transmission that you have uh, in, a, in an e-axle configuration, for example. Uh, there we do see, uh, let's say, the possibility for tier ones to kind of take out the piece of the cake from the, I would say, the focus, the attention of the of the OEM who are scaling their capabilities in, I would say, a high volume solution. Mm. But I would say the discussion is more complex. Uh, I mean, uh, several OEMs uh, have strong capabilities coming from the mechanic side, directly also translated to motors. So I would say for motors, we do see a lot more the case. Well, uh, also there is a in industrial planning uh, from the OEM side, okay, I want to give it to this plan to cover my demands, etc. And then for suppliers, those options are there. Uh, but instead on other fields and also with other OEMs who are a little bit less, I would say, uh, focus on uh, in-house production, then we do really have uh, te open technology discussion. I mean, like, what is best to electrify my fleet? And I think that's actually the discussion we are seeking in the end as uh, technology suppliers. And I guess um, by uh, for um, for Itachi, something similar, uh, but please uh, correct me. Um, in the end, you want to have an open discussion and also, again, more a partner discussion that we are seeking with, with the suppliers. Oh, oh we're sorry, with the OEMs. Thank you, Andrea. Um, we yeah, have another. Say, uh, sorry. Sorry, Z, you go ahead. No, sorry, it's, uh, it's okay. Yeah, so I would say definitely. Um, uh, I think um, suppliers do have the uh, long-term experience, and and uh, now as the OEMs are trying to seek a more in-house production, suppliers and OEMs are, are moving to more collaborative positions to develop new technologies. 
And at the same time, um, uh, I think some, as, as uh, Andrea just mentioned, some uh, OEMs do have stronger uh, background on, on, on manufacturing, et cetera. And, and I want to say uh, the, 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 the strong points or the advantages from the uh, supplier side is actually not only on the design, but also manufacturing of the product. And I think uh, earlier we, we touched on the topic of uh, uh, carbon neutralization for a more greener future. So as everyone talks about uh, e-mobility, uh, PM motors, um, there's also a lot of discussion regarding if using e-motors is actually bringing the, the planet to a more greener future because you have a lot of actually pollution in production, uh, producing uh, permanent magnets, for example, uh, during the, 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 the flow. So um, in, as a supplier and being a responsible supplier to the society, I think they should also uh, investigate it in the uh, how to uh, bring eco uh, environmental value to the to the uh, industry, uh, which means uh, for, uh, not only when the customer using the motors, they they are they are more green, but also to uh, realize a, a more greener solution during the production and using like for example more green greener energies in the production. Uh, providing a solution in manufacturing that is more uh, energy saving, et cetera. Yeah, I guess I, that's some of the strong points. Yeah. Sorry. I <laughs> shortly want to comment on that, Yi. I think that's a, it's a very big and important point uh, you mentioned. So I think it's known not only about the, the finished product itself, but also the, the whole chain. And uh, I think the chain uh, goes far, far beyond uh, the factory of the, of the OEM. And uh, Volkswagen Group is also doing sustainability ratings, uh, which are very important for, for the suppliers and to do to the business with, with the Volkswagen Group. And I think also it's also a mindset and not only regulations, I think, in, in some aspects, in some areas, we still have to have to go on, on this way. Uh, but I think it's really the whole production chain is, is important. And uh, for example, uh, the plant in Audi Brussels, uh, where the e-tron is built, was already CO2 neutral in uh, 2019. And then Audi Dieu, where we built cars and, and engines, uh, was CO2 neutral uh, next year. Uh, last year, sorry, uh, 2020. And we also have a plan to get the whole group, I think, if I remember correctly, at latest 2040 uh, CO2 free. But I'm not totally sure on that, so please don't uh, hang me uh, if I missed uh, if the year correctly. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I have, uh, and I think we'll do one or two more questions in the the time that we have left. Um, I have a potentially slightly controversial question, but I will ask it as it has uh, been upvoted um, by the audience quite heavily. Um, but it specifically is asking around the fact that China obviously controls uh, most of the magnet market. Um, is there a chance that European uh, OEMs or even suppliers um, make uh, choices to avoid magnets and start using more SRM or induction machines? I'm not sure if anyone can comment or is willing to comment on that. Well, I can comment only very shortly. Uh, our our uh, colleague, colleagues in, in Munich have announced that they are building magnet-free motors. Uh, I think uh, there are only two ways to do this, and I, if, you, if you look at the power data, it's very probable what, what system they are, they are doing. So I think uh, that's also something, uh, of course, we look into. Thank you, you for answering. Knows, I think, yeah, because in, in the history, the, the prices have been very volatile, and I think something as, as a big, big company, you have to uh, look into this issue. Thank you, Yari. Um, and I think uh, for the final question, so we've got more of a um, sort of a future looking uh, question. Um, I'll give each of you a, a chance to answer before we close off um, today, if you would like to. Uh, and this question is, um, if you could summarize um, as, as one main challenge for the supply chain, um, what do you think that main challenge would be over the next five to 10 years on a, on a global scale? If someone wants to kick us off here. For me, it's one word is, is transformation, making the best of the, of the human and uh, resources and also the factory resources, uh, how to get the, your product portfolio changed, because uh, I'm pretty sure it's, it's more or less irreversible. And uh, the sooner 
you start with it and with, with full power, I think the better. So I'd say it, it's transformation. I would say my word would be effectiveness. So, uh, I mean, I see the need of, uh, I mean, getting the whole value chain at a full effectiveness I mean, which is, I would say, not fully there. Also, the discussion of a missing, let's say, clear um, winning technology, winning standard, I think it's also burning a lot of time, effort, etc. So definitely effectiveness on technology footprint. And in the end, also, yeah, our, our value chain, which, which derives from that. Yeah, I think in my words, uh, I would use... Uh, value focus. When I say value, uh, it means not only the, the price, but actually uh, we have already talked about the, the social value, the economic value, the environmental value, but also the uh, value from the hardware, the software, or the whole uh, ecosystem. The, the mindset to, to change to this uh, value focus uh, is very important and, and, and lead us to a, uh, maybe a different future in the industry, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, from my side, Liam, I would say sharing is the word, uh, which means, of course, in terms of volumes, uh, because everyone is now looking, uh, with the e-mobility technology emerging, everyone is looking for efficiency in terms of uh, getting first economies of scale in terms of production, so com uh, conveying all, all the all the production scales within uh, fewer and bigger platforms, as well as uh, sharing in terms of uh, components, which means uh, the capability of reducing the, the weight and the space occupied by different components with higher level of integration expected, reducing the cost and, and ensuring more synergies and reducing the weight and the um, space loss within vehicles. Thank you, Claudio. The uh, unfortunate position of having to go last there, but I think it was still a very good answer. And thank you everyone else for the answers to the Q&A and obviously for the discussion uh, that we had earlier as well. So just to round off now for the last couple of minutes, um, thank you again to everyone that has tuned in for your engagement. Hope that this session has been uh, useful for you. As mentioned, uh, we will follow up um, and publish the rest of the questions with some answers from our panelists, um, and this will come out uh, on Thursday. Um, on Thursday as well, we will also have all of the recordings for the session from this morning uh, with IHS and Claudio, this session, and also the session that will be coming up tomorrow with Fraunhofer. All of those will become available. Um, and finally, uh, just to remind you all that the next session of eMobility Days will be taking place tomorrow afternoon. This is going to be hosted by Fraunhofer Institute and we'll be tackling the subject of closing the value chain in electromobility, which I think leads on quite nicely from some of the comments we've had here this afternoon. Um, that will be running from 2 to half 3 CET. So we hope to see you there and that you enjoyed the first day of Quai eMobility Days. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks again to all of our speakers. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Well.